Hello, beautiful souls, and welcome to another episode of Soul Over Matter podcast. I'm your host, Michelle, and today we have Clarissa Tu as our guest. She is a certified hypnotherapist, helping those struggling with anxiety change default patterns, tap into their inner resources, and take empowered action through hypnotic tools. Throughout her life, Clarissa has been interested in neuroscience which has translated into her passion for hypnotherapy. She also has a clinical doctorate in occupational therapy and practice as an occupational therapist in neuro rehabilitation prior to finding hypnotherapy. She became fascinated with it after witnessing the powerful and permanent effects it had on her own life as a client. She has since transitioned fully into entrepreneurship with her business, HypnoClarity, using a holistic approach to heal the mind, body, and spirit with hypnosis. Driven by her own healing journey, Clarissa's mission is to guide others in elevating consciousness and create a life of their design. So beautiful. Clarissa, welcome to Soul Over Matter. How are you? I am good. How are you, Michelle? I'm doing great. I have just been so lit up interviewing fellow co-authors of our book, Heart-Centered Leadership. And I'm just really excited to have you here and hear your story and your journey as a heart-centered leader. Um, So do you want to begin with how you got here, right? How your journey has unfolded up until this point? Yeah, I would love to. So um, I like to start with my family background. So my parents are refugees from Cambodia during the Khmer Rouge regime. So when they came here, they really had to just figure out how to live in a new land, right? And they didn't have any money, lost their parents in the refugee experience, didn't have like English, like that they had no language to really um, make it here. And so when they first got here was a lot of survivor mentality. Um, And that has created like a home environment in which she has so much love, a lot of anxiety, a lot of fight or flight, right? And so um, growing up, I also, you know, have to had to figure out how to be successful in America. Um, Parents didn't know, right? They, They just got by each day and just hoped that their children could have a better future. And so I always looked to the outside to figure out how to be successful. And I understand that that a lot of people do that, not, necess- not necessarily first-generation immigrants. I think the stakes and the attachment to that anxiety, that survivor mentality um, really came from my parents and how they were literally in flights, right? When they were refugees and, um, and for me essentially also still running, like continuing their run for survival by looking to the outside and see external measures of success, like vanity metrics. Right. And so, um, I very much followed the straight and narrow path, like with a family background, it's, you know, you go into healthcare, Um, or you become a lawyer. And so it was a very linear path for a while, like did well in school. Um, I went to UC Berkeley, studied pre-med there. um, And I eventually acknowledged to myself that medicine is not the path for me, but I still wanted to go into something safe, right? So occupational therapy, that was how I integrated some of the more holistic avenues of healing, some mental health, um, and, and in the end, you know, focus primarily still studying neuroscience, like physical rehabil- re- rehabilitation was what I went into as an OT. Um, and it was great. You know, I loved my work as an OT. Um, and then eventually I found hypnosis as a client and I went into hypnotherapy to work on just my family issues, my, um, my boundaries, working on my anxiety. I was just a high functioning person with a lot of anxiety. <laughs> yes. And, um, and it, it was really, really beneficial. I was so impressed with how I felt immediate results. It was not just effective, but it was 
fast and it was permanent. And so being the neuroscience nerd that I am, I was just like, oh, what is happening in my brain right now? And so I was just really curious and I went to school for it and I ended up loving it just so much and really seeing the benefit of joining the cause of advancing credibility for hypnosis that I left my full-time job as an OT. Um, I practiced for seven years at that point, invested a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of work into my training and into my patients, but really felt the call towards joining hip hypnotherapy um, and creating a, a better reputation for it because it's so powerful, but so stigmatized. I mean, there's so many... Um, you know, raised eyebrows that I face or um, skeptical questions. And I really wanted to be able to advance hypnotherapy, whereas go OT is fine as a field. Like it's, it's, it's established. It doesn't need um, any more advocacy. Well, I take that back. I think OT, like me, I think certain, a lot, a lot of healing professions can use more advocacy, but hypnotherapy really was in this underdog um, kind of arena. And I felt like I could um, move the needle a little bit more if I went into hypnotherapy. And so, um, yeah, super scary decision, like had to depart from, you know, my pension, my six figure salary, um, benefits and just jump into entrepreneurship. And so that was a really big heart centered decision I had to increase my therapy frequency with me no therapist when I departed, um, had a lot of self-work to do about fear of judgment. Um, but it was all for the better. Like I, I really love my life as a hypnotherapist right now. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. I love that you began this conversation with your family because I really believe um, we are not just ourselves or just this individual entity, right? We carry so much of the strengths and the weaknesses and the trauma right? Everything in our DNA from our parents and our, you know, parents, parents and down the line. So, and I remember that in your chapter talking about breaking that chain. So how, how does it feel to step out of that box, out of the status quo, out of, you know, that survival, right? Because a lot of what we do is just, we go to school and do the thing, right? And like, we don't think about it. We're on autopilot. And you said, no, I'm, I'm breaking this. I'm, I'm paving my own heart-centered path. Very liberating to do that. Um, and I feel so much freer now. I would say in the actual process of breaking the chain there, it was a lot of anxiety in addition to the anxiety I already had. <laughs> <laughs> anxiety with a sprinkling of anxiety <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah but in my heart I really knew that there was no other way for me and that I just had to like just take that leap because <clears throat> otherwise I would just be sitting in my regular nine to five job um, feeling like I was just part of this big system that I didn't really have any influence over. And um, although I 100% believe I did meaningful work as an OT, there was a part of me that just wasn't developing when I was doing my work, especially towards the end. And I think it's just so valuable to um, really have your work, which you spend eight hours a day doing, be something that reflects you, your values, your personal growth. And I really wanted to honor myself and my time and really feel what it's like to live my life. And, and so I broke away from OT and it was hard. I mean, my dad still asks me whether or not I'm going to go back to government work as an OT. Um, I don't think anyone, especially the older generation in my family, really understands what I do. Um, and it was a lot of self work to be okay with that. Like they don't have to understand. They don't have to validate. Like I know what I am doing. Um, and I know my path and other people don't know my heart the way that I know my heart. Um, and so there is just this relief that happens when you put down what you're supposed to carry. And then you kind of pick up what is meant for you. Um, 
And I definitely felt that weight come off and trying to fit into any sort of box that wasn't mine. Um, and yeah, and it, it, it really is something that I can't imagine going back to anymore after having experienced that authenticity. Mm, yeah, we can't go back, right? We can't go back to sleep. We can't go back to uh, quote unquote normalcy, right? Like yes. it's still so interesting. Like what is normal in our society is just this autopilot and mm -hmm. um, just what we're told to do and this um, rules, right? Like the rules, the boxes, the labels. And yeah. I feel for you too, it's like to break that people pleasing, right? To break that cultural that ancestral barrier of like no I'm going to pursue my heart and my soul and I get to go first right like you are literally going first for everyone before you and everyone after you like it, it ended with you and it also begins with you which is so yeah. potent and powerful that yeah I have chills um <laughs> so and I, I can resonate because I'm a speech therapist. So we both have that in common. Like we're just natural healers, right? It is that healing, helping field. And how did you get into hypnotherapy? Like how, how did that, how did you become a client? Right. Cause I always find like, there's a modality that always finds us mm -hmm. and we're not looking for it. <laughs> Yeah. So it, it was really a stroke of luck. Honestly, I had a friend at that time just refer me to my hypnotherapist. Um, and I still see that hypnotherapist. So it was my, I didn't have to look, it was like a one and done. And it was such a great connection. She was also um, a Vietnamese refugee, just completely understood. And five years later, I still see her when I need to work through something. Um, and so that's how I found hypnosis. And you're right. I think it just found me because what are the chances that like my one friend out of a bunch of friends that I do have would just lead me to the perfect hypnotherapy, hypnotherapist for me. And how did you feel after, like, how did you before the session, like, how did you feel knowing you were moving into something that you've never experienced? And then how did it feel after? Was there an aha? Was, was it a subtle shift in transformation? Because sometimes it, it could be either or. I was excited to try something new. I'm very open-minded and I was very interested at that point in healing my patterns. Um, and so I went in, I went into the session not really knowing what to expect with how to feel because there are some things I don't think you'll possibly know until you experience. And after the hypnotherapy session, I went in so deep that I had to sit in the, the waiting room for like 20 minutes before I was like, okay, I think I could. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which probably gives you a hint of how much I needed to relax. <laughs> just on overdrive that once I went into hypnotherapy, it was just like the body just really needed it. Um, and on the drive home, I was like stunned with some of the revelations that came out of it. Um, and a lot of it resonated on a very deep level. And so when um, you're in hypnosis, it's a, a, an opening to your subconscious mind, which I consider your heart, right? And there's like the conscious logical mind. Um, and then there's what's underneath, which is not logical, which means yes, a lot of people think the subconscious um, creates sabotaging patterns, which which it does, right? It's it's a uh, it, it, it um, almost like it protects you from what it considers to be unsafe and unfamiliar. But it also has this whole other beautiful side to it, which is where your intuition lies, your wisdom lies. Um, and that is also not logical either. And so being able to tap into that when I was in hypnosis really just gave me a really honest, raw connection with myself, which I don't remember feeling before that, mm -hmm. um, because it just kind of took all the defenses of the logical mind out and really allowed me to see myself and my truth. Um, and even just feeling that driving home, I was 
shook. I was like, wow, this is such a true connection to myself. Um, And then I realized just how much was layered on in the conditioning, like what wasn't mine. And I needed to continue to do the work to come to understand myself. And that was only the beginning. Um, It was the awareness that there was work to do in exploring myself. And it was a whole process after that and coming to speak to my heart because my heart has been shut down so many times by logic that there was there wasn't a relationship and Mm so yeah it really catapulted like that um awareness that like this is something I need to really focus on is just to get get to know who I am because I didn't know who I was um, which was kind of scary so that first session was like wow, it was so deep. It was very magical. Like I I saw myself in ways I didn't see myself before, but at the same time, it opened up this whole, I don't know myself. (laughs) The can of worms, right? That like Mm -hmm. the awakening of ourselves, of our true soul, right? Our true heart. And it's, yeah, it's like almost like that first step, right? It's like, Okay, Mm -hmm. I said yes to this. I'm aware of it. Now I get to change it. Now I get to or dive deeper into it. Now I get to actually do the real work. Mm -hmm. Um, And you are actually my first hypnotherapist on Soul Over Matter. So I'd love for you to share more about I know you touched on a little bit, but like, how does a session look right? Because I remember for me growing up, we think hypnosis is like the guy on TV that, you know, he's just showing you like this spiraling thing and you're hypnotic and you're just under this trance, but it's so much deeper than that. Can you share more about what a session looks like, how you work with your clients? Absolutely. So a session consists of two parts. It's the cognitive portion of it and also the hypnosis. So it starts with clients coming in, um, talking about the issue that they are presenting with. And, you know, I work with them to essentially um, counsel an interview and an inquire so that we can like really drill down as to what the issue really is, because a lot of times they come (laughs) with an issue. (laughs) We think we know the issue. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Jokes on us humans. (laughs) Exactly. And so um, when we, once we drill down, right, um, like for example, if somebody is coming to me to heal anxieties over a relationship and they came, um, they came in because they had a really difficult fight with a partner and, and then realizing like what the thing they fought about, like that isn't actually the real thing that they were fighting about. And what, what really is their fear here? That's creating that anxiety, creating the conflict and, and what they want it to be like instead. Um, and mm-hmm. so I'm always, you know, taking notes with how they speak because the way that a client explains things and phrases things in their own language, that's what their mind is going to be most receptive to when I take them into hypnosis. And the hypnosis portion of it is the subconscious, por- subconscious portion. So, um, so I take some the information that they talk about, the changes that they like to see or whatever it is that they're trying to process through. And I, um, after inducting the state of hypnosis in them, bringing them into that really calm, um, kind of dreamy state, but they're still awake. Um, And I take them on what I call a hypnotherapy journey in which they kind of experience um, this sense of immense calm and now also experiencing the self that they are wanting to be really getting to know that version of themselves on a visceral level and they're so familiar with that now that when they go into their regular conscious life um, whenever they get triggered they have now another option because their subconscious feels safe and familiar with whatever we rehearse in hypnosis but I also do allow room for discovery in hypnosis too it's not just goal attainment um, and that that I, that I just described is an example of goal attainment, right? But then there's also that wisdom in the subconscious that we want to tap into. Um, and if we're dealing with something like some kind of, for example, fear of abandonment, like with um, relationships, um, what that 
obstacle like really means to them, how that keeps them from getting close to their partner. And in hypnosis, like we have access to more insight that we might not be able to see when we're just in the hustle and in the grind. And so um, I sometimes use hypnosis for that reason to help clients gain more insight. What is the real issue and because sometimes even if we talk about it in, in the cognitive portion there might be more information that comes out when they are in this conscious state of hypnosis um and they start to create a different relationship with their obstacle you can call it their shadow whatever it is that they're having trouble with um accepting about themselves or accepting within the relationship, right? And so, um, so it's it's almost like being able to shake up in hypnosis the way that they see themselves, they relate to themselves and relate to the obstacles that they're facing. Um, and already the, sh the shift in relationship happens in hypnosis and through this process of self-discovery. Um, and we tap into their inner wisdom to um, like depending on what the client resonates with, sometimes I invite in like a wise guide um, and that allows more wisdom to be brought into their situation. And really the wise guide is a version of themselves, plot twist, right? Like when we wake up, <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, you know, no that. one's coming to save us except that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So through this process, they really learn that they can rely on themselves for their own answers. Mm -hmm. Um and when they go out into their regular life, they realize that, hey, everything I have is actually within me because inside hypnosis, I found all the answers that I needed and they, they came out just the right way for me. And only I know the right answers for myself. And so, um, so I do love that about hypnosis, that it is both great for goal attainment and self-discovery. Mm -hmm. So amazing. Yeah, I've had a few hypnotherapy sessions in my life and they've all been life-changing and I feel like they bring such clarity, like you said before, right? It, it brings us back to ourselves and really it, it's almost like this clear channel between our soul and like what we need, right? And there's no conditioning or like any muck in the middle. It's just like this clear, like you are the facilitator to create that channel for your clients and it's it's such a beautiful modality. I really, it's one that I really do come back to um, when I am moving through things where I need to find the answers to, right? And I need to do it. Um, and I just find it so brave too, to be like, this is this, to go straight, like to, to leave OT, because I actually still do speech work, because I just love working with kids. But to go from OT and be like, no, I I'm taking the leap. I'm following my heart and I'm creating this life, right? Because that's what entrepreneurship is. It's, and you share that it's like this wild roller coaster ride. We have, what I think you called it the wild, wild west. <laughs> yeah, yes. That's exactly what I called it. <laughs> and it's like, it's so true. Cause we're like, we don't, we don't know what we're doing. And there was a quote you your mantra my mission is louder than my fear and I just read that and I feel like that is such a testament to the entrepreneurial journey can you share more about where that mantra came from how you embody it how you move through that fear because we always have fear Mm -hmm. It came from a coach and it just resonated so much that it just became one of my mantras. And it reminds me to always go back to my why um, and that my mission is so much bigger than any of the potential consequences that I will face with taking this leap. And honestly, I think a lot of my fears are based in things that never do happen like the judgment that I'm worried about that I never end up hearing. I mean, <laughs> I mean, some people do give me questioning glances for sure for hypnotherapy, but the way that my mind catastrophizes it, like thinks I'll basically just like bury myself in shame. If that happens, that, that actually does not happen. And like now when um, people do ask me questions, I'm able to come from a place of, Oh, they just don't know. And it's my place to educate them. It doesn't mean anything about me, but it's almost as if the fears that um, 
held me back at the beginning coming to realize now after having been in entrepreneurship for a while that it's a lot bigger than they actually are and the real thing that holds its true weight and size in my heart is my mission um so to really lean on that when I have these moments and when which I go into fight or flight because I don't feel accepted honestly Mm. yeah to to move through that and to 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 honor it too right to accept it because we are as heart-centered leaders we are here to go first we are here to change the status quo to I don't want to say be weird but like to shift out of that autopilot out of Mm -hmm. that like you said that nine to five that grind and I always PSA here it's like we're not telling anyone to quit their day job, like, but, but also, and also to listen to the whispers because our soul, our heart, we all have a purpose here. Right. And it's, it, it's always there. It just, we might not be hearing it or not. Right. Yes, exactly. And I really like the um, message that you wrote about too, was that we are lighthouses and our job is just to shine as we are with our purpose with our mission with our gifts and whoever is meant to follow the guidance of that lighthouse great and if not that's okay different soul path doesn't have to mean anything about us yeah and and we do really help those who's um following that beacon of light Um, and that's that's all we can do and we're honest with ourselves we attract people who can really benefit from us in the meantime and everyone else there's another way for them too and to just have that release yeah thank you it's Mm -hmm. for me too it was yeah there were moments of my the beginning of my journey where I just wanted to help everyone right and like I didn't necessarily want to be right but I wanted to show that there was another way and and you know, help others and and help heal and, Hey, look, you can have a better life, but it's like, we're not meant to do that. We're meant to stand in our truth and share our voice and share from our heart and the people, what is, it's like, not everyone is meant to hear us. Everyone might listen, but not everyone will resonate with our message. Yeah. I love that. It's a very trusting way in which we're living our purpose just we're just being ourselves. we shine our light whoever comes was meant to come all all along um and yes like not everybody is meant to hear our message and that's okay yeah then we wouldn't I I think I shared that in my chapter I'm like then we wouldn't be actually ourselves because we wouldn't be following that individual path that Mm -hmm. our soul chose right we're not really meant to be liked by everyone we're not meant to be heard by everyone and it's such a beautiful way to like you said come back to your why come back to your truth and I think that's such a testament of knowing who you are right I remember in your chapter it's like what do you want Clarissa right like that number one question that I feel like every person on this earth gets exactly yeah (laughs) yeah it's so simple that question but the process of answering it is not exactly simple and it changes right like I I've changed personally I've changed my wants and my desires and my whys over the last couple of years and it's just following what lights you up right? It's following what sparks joy in you, what um, you feel good doing, right? It's like, when you find what you're meant to do, you feel like you don't work a day in your life. And like you said before, if you're working eight hours a day, and you don't like your job, that's like two thirds. I think that's a fact. It's like, our job is two thirds of our life. (laughs) That's crazy. Yes. (laughs) Yes. And to be miserable or feel like you're like, I don't need dramatic, but like dying inside in a way. Right. Because 
I mean, we are dying every single day. And to live, truly live within this period that you have when you're working two thirds of your life, right? And um, that requires being truly honest with yourself and letting yourself take whatever form is authentic to you. And if you're not, if you're changing yourself to fit some kind of box, then you're not really living. Right? And you're just suppressing like your truth, like your soul. Um, yeah. So two thirds of your life, it's a, lo- it's a lot of time to be spending doing that. Right. And like yeah. before, before 2020, it was like all that time to commuting and like, God, if you don't enjoy your life, I mean, and also that it can zap our life force, right. When we're not doing mm-hmm. something that fulfills us right satisfies Uh, us that takes away from our creativity and um that space in our brain that Mm -hmm. could hold that but it's so filled with the stress and the anxiety and all the all that unnecessary energy I like to call them energy leaks yes energy leaks is a good way to put it but yes I like the phrase zap our life force too um it's a less dramatic way of saying dying inside. <laughs> but I mean, we, we're also dying every day. I, I haven't heard that one in a while. I remember that. It's like, oh shit, yeah, we are. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But exactly, it's like you don't allow your own creative and artistic expression if you are trying to fit into someone else's mold. Um, and that really is what brings you and your unique unique gifts and talents to life and so I'm always a big advocate if like it feels like you're in autopilot or you're you feel like you're not honors honoring something then take a step back and just really give yourself that time to be with yourself and evaluate um, what is the life that I want for myself, your values? Yes. Like you said, it changes. I mean, I thought I was going to be an OT. I, I was crazy about OT when I was in OT and to start acknowledging when, oh, the path that I paved for myself actually is not the path that's true for this version of myself anymore and what that's going to look like. And, and that does take courage to slow down, get out of that autopilot, um, that, carousel that we're on that's spinning in the wrong direction you know it takes that courage to jump off and stop it and start gaining momentum in the other direction but it really is worth the investment and it's only a little bit harder at the beginning and it gets easier as you gain momentum and you really do need that time to be comfortable with sitting with yourself and listen to your heart Um, it's hard to do I think it's hard to really get out of that autopilot sometimes because it's what's easy and it's what you know um but you're gonna live such a aligned life as a result of taking these intentional moments to yourself beautiful yeah Mm -hmm. that's a great segue into your chapter is this the first time you have become an author yes it is (laughs) how does it feel it feels amazing like and I really felt like it was such divine timing that I was invited to write this. Um, it really did create a lot of healing for my family trauma. Um, yes, because I talked about my whole story about how I went to hypnotherapy, how family trauma, generational cycles, all that impacted my decision making. Um, but that opportunity to really sit and reflect and journal about it was really healing for me in um, understanding how to change generational patterns and how I relate to my parents. Um, And so on a personal level, like it really aligned with the healing that I needed to do, like this quote unquote professional work, which I feel like it's all muddled together anyway. (laughs) Yes. And I think it was perfect that it was done in community, writing a chapter with other like-minded individuals. Um, And it was so enlightening to just be in the presence of other authors I love doing our collaborations Instagram lives and just see how we really all took that step forward and had that courage to be heart-centered and really do see the value in it I was just having a conversation with someone the other day and he was like well this is actually really niche you know like this isn't something that you hear about very much and he was um 
you know, he was uh, like in, in the armed forces before too. And he was like, yeah, this is something that like, you know, we could adopt to a lot of different, um, different cultures, including army, right. Mm -hmm. Or like, or corporate culture. Um, So it was really lovely to see how it wasn't just like my book that I wrote in isolation. I wrote this chapter with other people who are also invested in creating the movement and how it's having this ripple effect to people who are reading it, who are thinking about places where um, this could really be beneficial. And um, I felt like I was just really lucky to happen to get invited into this project and be supported through it with our other co-authors too. Um, It was an amazing experience it it brought me more than I expected Mm. yeah I agree with you about how it became almost like a healing journey for ourselves right because sometimes we'll start writing or journaling and this can happen for anyone even if you're listening like sometimes we put pen to paper and things come up that we hadn't thought about one in like 10 15 20 years but also maybe our entire lives and then it just starts pouring out. And I remember saying like, it's, it is, it's, it's, it's own journey. And I don't know. It's also my first time, like being in an actual physical book. Like I've written articles before, but this is just, I say it to to everyone. It's like, we have our words permanently written in the world and we don't know who's reading it. Right. Like you just, had someone from the army tell you how impactful this book is how does that feel it feels really oh my gosh I think you were just saying this earlier when we were chatting like I I still I still don't feel like it has hit me (laughs) like yes yes like I think that the launch process like you were saying is the beginning of it but when someone says something like that I don't think I've actually integrated into my body just yet. Mm-hmm. Like I, I understand the value of it, but like, yeah, hasn't really landed in my being because it feels so surreal still. Yeah. I feel you. I feel you. And what we shared before we started recording, right. It's like the launch is, is almost like that first step because it's not just a book. It's a movement And if anyone's listening, if you haven't bought Heart-Centered Leadership yet, go to Amazon, get your copy because it's 22 really heart-centered entrepreneurs, leaders, coaches. I mean, we come from all walks of life and there's, I call it like the chicken soup for the spiritual soul because it's like, or the entrepreneurial leader soul, doesn't matter, but there's something for everyone. And it, the thread is like you said, this niche, because it it is so heart led. And we I think, and you can share with me too. But I think we just assume now that like entrepreneurship, it's just it is it is, it, it just is what it is. But we're so ingrained in it. And we're such a part of it, that we forget we're in this bubble. And like you said, like your dad, I mean, my parents too, like a lot of people don't know what I do. <laughs> And it's like, when are you going to get a real job again? Or like, when are you going to get a full, like, yeah, it's, it's, um, I think it, it brings us back when we do hear from someone not in our, our niche or our bubble. How mm-hmm. does that resonate with you? Oh, for sure. I relate to parents wondering if this is just a temporary thing, kind of like, is playtime over yet? Kind yes. of attitude. <laughs> yes and so it's really nice to be in community with other entrepreneurs who have committed to it this is their lifestyle and like you said there's no going back and for me that's not a reality to just go back to the normal nine to five um you know never say never but then I feel like if if ever I I come to a point in which I I do it would be from like a whole different perspective in which like that creating of something that is my own will always be a part of my life regardless of like if I have a nine to five or not just that ownership over my business my work my purpose um and I you know thinking about it now it's just like I've had success with creating my hypnotherapy business and I've 
And I can see how much farther it can go, like with the other inspirational people around me, these 22 authors included. Um, And I think that just really helps with building that momentum like forward when you have this community of people who believe in the same things with their work, who um, believe in your work. And I think that is also just so wonderful, the encouragement from the other authors as well. And there's this propelling forward of like, okay, yes, like, you know, big dreamers really push forward other big dreamers and you just ride this wave together. And it just makes it so much more possible more more than possible I think um to really imagine a life in which I don't need to go back to Mm -hmm. nine to five and so the community aspect is really important to really lean on one other's strengths one other's visions um and you know a, a lot of businesses do fail unfortunately and I do think that being around people who are supportive um, and can give you that hope like when things aren't looking good like it it keeps you on that forward trajectory um, to just not give up yeah to keep going and Mm -hmm. to course correct if you need to but yeah, yeah it's I I do I think the community collaborative aspect of our book too really resonated with me because Mm -hmm. yeah we do we we're all in our own you know entrepreneurial bubbles like one-on-one with clients you know on our Instagram on our pages and when we come together to to read and to inspire one another and you know I've been interviewing so many of our co-authors and it is it's like this spark moves through me after every interview where it's like yes we are doing it and I also think that's such great advice you you inadvertently shared to anyone who is just starting out right who has that idea or that inspiration and is like well and I shared that in my chapter it's like well no one's gonna listen or who are who are you to do this right you don't have X, Y, and Z, like all the trainings or whatever. And to rally yourself around other people who are visionaries, right? Because as visionaries, we are creating a new world. There is no one in front of us. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's unchartered. Especially for those who, like my mom is an immigrant and I, I come from that too, of that generational ancestral breaking of the chains and I have chills because I feel like both of our ancestors like our sets of ancestors here you know and and some of those fears like you shared before aren't ours right Mm -hmm. that anxiety that um, fight or flight it's we are experiencing it in our DNA in our body so that we can transmute it and it's it it's one of the most powerful works and like uh, deep dives that I do with myself, with clients when, and it doesn't have to be immigrant, it could be anyone, but a lot of times, I mean, that's, that's what can come up, right. In hypnotherapy sessions where it's like, well, where did that thought come from? That's not even mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just got a lot of chills too, (laughs) just hearing you talk about how the, yes, that we're experiencing it so we can transmute it. That's a beautiful way to express that Michelle that's such a gift with words Um, (laughs) yes it does remind me of a client that I worked with also on generational trauma and he um you know within the process of our program saw an energy healer who was very connected and told him like your ancestors are telling me to tell you thank you for doing this cycle breaking work Mm. Um, yeah (laughs) get me emotional girl Um, yeah I've I've heard that from my ancestors too it's um it's it's powerful and I I like to share that with my clients too it's like the emotions you're feeling it it's it's not just yours you know the pain the trauma the you know also taking the strains I mean the the, the bravery that those who have come before us for survival are, that's like running through our veins. And yeah. it's, um, yeah, when I read that part of your chapter, it really resonated with me. 
because this isn't easy work. And you shared that too. This is hard work, like to wake up, to face ourselves, to face our fears, to, to keep going. So on the days where you do feel like giving up, where you do feel like throwing in the towel, um, what are some things that help you get back into alignment? I do think that whenever I connect with un- other entrepreneurs, it continues to feel that fire and, and they really do believe in me um, sometimes more than I see in myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that helps me get into alignment. And I also think that, you know, it's, it's very valuable to surround yourself with this community, but I've also been doing the work to learn how to provide that for myself too, to show myself ways in which I have overcome more than I, I knew I could in entrepreneurship. Um, wouldn't have imagined I'd be in this place I'm at now with my practice. Um, and right now it's a, a season for me of just allowing, like trying to welcome in more feminine energy and seeing how without pushing so much like you know I'm still getting consults booked through my website I'm still getting new clients rolling in and this isn't something that I ever knew would be part of my reality subconsciously I think I've always just been a very like active need to make things happen type of a human um and getting to this place in which I could just um allow and receive and my business still grows isn't something that I would have imagined for myself before and so just thinking back to like how I have changed grown shown myself that I could do things that I didn't even have awareness that I could do has really helped center me like when I'm about to throw in the towel um and also just reaching out to community for that support too a little bit of both internal external support yeah beautiful Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. that um breaking those chains too right of that like Mm -hmm. wounded masculine linear structure Mm -hmm. that we grew up Mm -hmm. with like to hustle to work really hard and yes work hard but it can also be easeful at times right Mm -hmm. it can we can lend ourselves to the flow and trust Mm-hmm. that it is going to work out the way that it's meant to because a lot of times our human brain is limited right and sometimes it turns out even better than we could have imagined like you said yeah. it's like mm-hmm. I also couldn't imagine having a podcast and yeah. having clients and you know doing all these things that years ago I was the one listening to podcasts like my own sure. right so yeah. it's trippy yeah. yes it is trippy Yeah, definitely really sitting and also letting it transmute this masculine energy that I'm so used to running through my veins, right? That I have to have like my fingers and everything for things to work out. And so just really taking the time to sit with that and let that kind of move through my system so that I can allow more space now for like divine feminine energy. Yeah, I love that. I remember you just reminded me that the the frenemy control and your the relationship with with control in your and I like how you capitalize control in your Mm -hmm. in your chapter yeah yeah I personified it definitely um yeah it is a friend and it's an enemy like it has helped me get to a certain place in my life but at a cost Mm. Mm -hmm. and now it's almost like this unraveling right in a this unraveling this unearthing um mm-hmm. that we can have control but we can also it's it's both and right it, it's mm-hmm. not either or anymore and that I think is also the the journey of entrepreneurship it, it yeah. we can have both we can um embody both integrate both because again nothing's inherently wrong it's just how are we utilizing it how is it intentional in our lives Mm -hmm. yeah because if we over function in one area you know it might not allow for the others and we do want that balance right at the end of my chapter I talk about atonement you know at one mint and how it is and both and like you said it is both control and surrender that work together harmoniously and for your favor Um, and 
yes, to become aware of how I personally perhaps overfunctioned in the control, not enough surrender, but to bring it back to a place in which they can really truly work together so that I can manifest the life that I want for myself. Mm, and that's the name of your chapter, right? Becoming at one. Yes. I love it. Oh my goodness, Clarissa, this was such a embodied, heartfelt, empowering conversation. And I just thank you for sharing your story, for sharing your wisdom and your journey with everyone listening. Where can people work with you? Where can people find you? You can find me on Instagram, just Clarissa underscore two, first and last name with an underscore. Um, and my website, hypnoclaritytherapy.com. You can book a complimentary consultation there. I always feel called to educate about hypnosis. So if anyone is ever curious, I do free consult slash education sessions, essentially. So um, find me on my website. Amazing. Well, thank you for being here and connecting. It was such a pleasure having you. Thank you, Michelle. Have a good day.